In March of 2020, a young scientist at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard started to study exactly how the coronavirus pandemic began. She decided that a lab accident in Wuhan, China could be one plausible explanation. But that subject triggered a political firestorm. Over the past 20 months, Alina Chan has been attacked by one camp online and called a hero by another. She's written a new book, and I went to Cambridge to talk with her about what she calls her exhausting journey. So what you started to see all the way back when we were all in lockdown and you were here in Cambridge, yeah. things just didn't add up to you, is that right? Yes, or, or rather, some scientists and some journalists were too quick to call a lab origin hypothesis a conspiracy theory. So without any available evidence at the time in early 2020, they were already sure in their minds that there was no way this virus could have come from a lab. So to me, that was anti-scientific. So you started doing your own research and you found like-minded scientists and some amateur internet sleuths online, yes. is yes. that right? Uh, yeah, they, they prefer to call themselves independent analysts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you want people to understand that you're asserting in this book? So the first thing is to convey the importance of finding the origin of COVID-19. This is not a, you know, a small matter that we can just forget ever happened and we don't need to find out how this happened and, and prevent it from happening. We need to know how it happened because the details are important for informing a strategy to prevent a future pandemic like this. And the last thing is really a human resolution. Like We have all been impacted by this pandemic in some way. Some of us have lost like, loved ones. And so we, we need to know the answer. So the book catches everyone up on the last two years almost of uh, the search for the origin. So it tells you all the key figures in the story, all the key discoveries and findings. And it tells you really that we are just at the beginning of this investigation. We haven't actually had an investigation of the origin of COVID-19. So the book is meant to explain to people why the lab origin hypothesis uh, was a conspiracy theory, was cast as a conspiracy theory in early 2020, and how now it is a completely plausible, in fact, maybe likely, <laughs> origin scenario of COVID-19. Sure. Well, what do you say to, you've received harsh criticism. Yes. And some people believe that you have uh, pushed this theory that uh, it leaked from a lab by yeah. accident, yeah. but that there's really no evidence for that right now, is there? So there's no evidence whatsoever for a natural origin or a lab origin. So all of the existing evidence is circumstantial. Even for a natural origin, it's completely circumstantial. And right now, if you weigh both of them, it's about the same. And some might say even a bit more for the lab origin, depending on who you ask. So in so, the book, you lay out the scientific data for both hypotheses. Yes. And you want the reader to decide what they think is yes. more likely? Yes, we, we don't push the reader to decide, although it's good to tell people ahead of time that Matt really Lee and I, my co-author and I, we do lean towards the lab leak. Just based on all of the things we've seen in the past two years, we do lean towards the lab leak. But in the book, we make the strongest argument possible for each origin, and we let the readers decide. So we, we don't know the answer. <laughs> Nobody knows the answer, at least publicly. Why do you think it has made people so angry that you continue to ask these questions? So we saw in early 2020 already, starting from even day one of the pandemic, that it was quickly politicized. So not just uh, reporters, but even politicians and even some scientists called anyone who was asking whether this could have, could have come from a lab. They called them racist. They called them anti-Chinese. They called them uh, anti-science. And so these were all really extreme ways to depict um, just, just asking a question, could this have escaped from a lab by accident? Like even a, a virus that was collected, being worked off in the lab, accidentally infecting someone. This is a completely plausible uh, scenario. It's happened many times. And in, in the US in 2019 alone, on average, there were more than four accidental exposures or releases of select agents. So the most dangerous of the dangerous, like viruses and toxins. So this is not some far-fetched, like imaginary hypothesis. This would not be highly unusual. This happens in laboratory research all the time. Yes, and it's increasing because there are more and more laboratories nowadays engaging in this type of research. So dozens of them spread out across the globe. And it's not a China-only problem because it, it's happening in more and more countries. Mm. So if we continue to ignore this possibility of future outbreaks stemming from labs, then we are just leaving ourselves open to these outbreaks. So what do you want to see happen now? So I'd like to see them release all of these information so we can build a fuller picture of what was happening in Wuhan in 2019. Um, I know that there are a lot of people trying to see what type, of, what type of person I am, what type of qualifications I am. 
I just have to say, I'll let the book speak for itself. Uh, come and watch any of my interviews or talks and, and see for yourself whether I'm a reasonable person. But for me, uh, this is really just about the search. It's a scientific question, like where did this virus come from? A recent study just, just released, like I think last week, uh, reveals that they had been checking thousands of animals across China since 2017 until now, and they have found zero traces of viruses closely related to SARS-CoV-2, the virus that caused COVID-19. So there's no sign of SARS-CoV-2 in the wildlife trade except for a handful of pangolins. And we now know that there were no pangolins on sale in Wuhan mm. in, in the years leading up to the pandemic. So where is the link between the virus SARS-CoV-2 and the wildlife trade. Mm. But you have pointed out that you do not take a political stance in this book. It isn't uh, pro-Dr. Fauci or anti-Dr. Fauci. No. It's not Democrat or Republican. You really want people to just read the scientific data? Yes, I want them to read the scientific data and to push for actions. So actual measures to make this type of pathogen research safer, make it more transparent. So the next time a pandemic of ambiguous origins happens, we have a better chance of tracking its origins. Origins. And I'm not ruling out the natural origin at all. In fact, we make a very strong argument for it in the book. It's still completely possible that future pandemics, <laughs> not just possible, but very likely that more pandemics will emerge from the wildlife trade. So we also have to take actions to, to stop that, to, to stop wildlife animal trafficking and farming. Hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, why do you think so many world-renowned scientists were so invested in dispelling this theory that it might be a lab leak so early on? I, I think one possibility is groupthink. So when you see a lot of really established virologists saying that a lab leak is a conspiracy theory, you don't want to become the conspiracy theorist. You know, you don't want to like, oh, I, I, I'm now going to support this conspiracy theory. So there was a lot of groupthink happening. And then just over the past year and a half, we've seen a lot of disturbing information, uh, like leaked documents pointing to risky pathogen research done in Wuhan. So I think more people are starting to, to give the lab origin hypothesis a bit more of, of an opportunity. Right. Yeah. What do you think we should do for laboratory safety worldwide moving forward? So there are many things we can do. Um, in fact, I'm talking about quite a few of this in my talk tonight. <laughs> um, the first thing really is to uh, install a new moratorium. And I know a lot of scientists hate that. They, like, I don't want my research to be regulated. But I think when you consider that there are millions of lives hanging in the balance, like we, we need a new international moratorium. If it can't be international, at least amongst uh, <laughs> countries that are willing to, to have such a moratorium. You know, just, just lay out all of the data that we have today. Make sure that there are central data repositories. Make sure that data are always published in a very timely manner so that people don't accumulate dangerous virus sequences and data for years and years without telling people. Mm, so you want to make sure there's transparency and all yeah. the research and data. Yeah. But also, you don't think it's such a good idea for this kind of coronavirus research to keep moving forward until yes. we know how this began? Yes, and, and so I think even if we don't know for sure that COVID-19 came from a lab, the, the fact that it could have come from a lab is sufficient to push for a moratorium. Mm -hmm. Because do we really need to wait for another pandemic of ambiguous origin before we have a moratorium? <laughs> do we need to wait for more millions of lives to be lost before we, we really sit up and have a, have a moment where we are the, this, this cannot continue? Uh, from two years ago to right now, yeah. you point out there hasn't been much change. Yes, exactly. So where we are at today is where we were at two years ago. So there has been no new measure, as far as I can tell, to make pathogen research safer or more transparent. Um, any of the small policy changes made regarding the wildlife trade have been pretty cosmetic. So they, they haven't really impacted the wildlife trade. And if you talk to wildlife conservation uh, organizations, they, they will tell you that. Hmm. So no matter which theory is correct, yes. nothing has been done to yes. improve the situation <laughs> either way. Yes, and, and that's why I think it's so important to find the origin of COVID-19, because sometimes people need to know before they respond. So it's really hard to push people to take hmm. action, to, to take the appropriate measures when they don't believe right. that this virus could have come from the lab or from the wildlife trade. Do you think we'll ever know the origin of COVID-19? Uh, absolutely, because we live in an age where almost everything is recorded, like emails, you've got your phone, data is uploaded everywhere, like, and, and people are sending each other messages like at an unprecedented scale across countries. So right now, it might not be safe 
for people to share what they know. But over the next five years, 10 years, maybe even like 20 to 40 to 50 years, mm. it, we might come to a point where someone who knows the answer, and, and I bet there are people who know the answer, know where this virus came from, they finally feel safe enough that they can tell us without endangering all of their co-workers. Let me ask on a personal level, mm -hmm. because anyone who follows you on Twitter has seen that you have been attacked from all kinds of different avenues, in addition to people who think you're very brave. Mm -hmm. And you have very, uh, been very clear and consistent and kept saying, no, no, I believe that this really should be investigated. Um, what do you think gave you the strength to do, to do that? I'm not sure, but I have a lot of people to thank. So I want to make it clear, no one told me to do this. Like, I don't have a plan or a scheme. Mm. <laughs> like, this all began just, just because I wanted to ask the question, could, could this have come from nature or from a lab? And somehow just, just raising the lab hypothesis offended a whole bunch of people and, and powerful people. Um, but behind the scenes, in private, actually have received a great deal of support from other scientists and even other virologists have emailed me or, or you know, sent me letters even just saying, don't stop digging, you're on the right track. And so when I see these from established virologists and scientists, and they can't go public because they might jeopardize their labs and their careers and the people working for them, I feel like I have to do what I can in my mm. position to, to push for answers. Right. How do you feel about the Chinese government in terms of um, the data that has not been released there? Uh, and, and how do you feel about your role in pushing for these questions? So I, I need to reiterate that this is not a China problem. Although this pandemic started in China, who knows when, where the next pandemic might start? It, it could be any of these countries where there's a roaring wildlife trade or where there's a lot of risky pathogen research happening. So no one wants to be in the next Wuhan, right? It's just unfortunate that this time it came from China. And so I wish that asking this question wasn't so political. I wish that it didn't offend any government. But really, we're thinking about future pandemics that could happen to any country. So we need to ask this in the least... Uh, politicized way possible, the least polarizing way possible. And for me, it's not about assigning blame. Like, this, again, this could happen in any country where this type of activity is happening. So we just need to find solutions. And, and to find solutions, we need to find answers. Are you afraid for your safety? Sometimes. In what way? So, I mean, uh, there have been some pretty vicious <laughs> attacks on, on, on my reputation by, by Chinese state media and also by a lot of anonymous Twitter users and, and some non-anonymous people have sent some pretty threatening emails. Uh, but yeah, it makes me worried. But at the end of the day, I have to keep pushing. So I, mm. you know, I, I lose sleep about it. I'm freaked out and I don't have a plan for myself, but I am not a victim. Like I have agency. And I've decided that in spite of these risks, I'm still going to keep asking. And I hope that other scientists and experts and leaders will also find their courage and start asking for this.